Marcus. Big Sean. What is up, man? How's your trade going? <laughs> Trade's going the same. You surprised me. You just hit the hit the record button. <laughs> It's getting late where you are, so I want to make sure you get to bed at a good hour. And uh, is Bitcoin digital or is it physical? <laughs> we, were, we were having a little argument. It wasn't an argument. It was a it was a good discussion. And That's obviously digital. What's your take? Oh, come on! <laughs> I said it's digital. You see, <laughs> physical. You know what? Honestly. Every time that we have a, a disagreement, you always end up being right. So uh, I'm just going to take your word for it. That's what I'm going to do. I'd argue with you, but yeah, we already know that I'm going to be right anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You're just wiser. You're a little bit older than me, a little bit wiser. And uh, no, dude, I'm, I, I hate, like, I would never say I'm always right because no oh, yeah, yeah i know i'm just we're just we're just having good banta good banta good banta mate okay well uh to everyone who is new welcome in this is episode 18 of bitcoiners guide the show that we wish we would have had when we first started learning about bitcoin so we made a few we're your host Big Sean Harris and Plan Marcus. Today is Monday, June 20th. It's 4.31 p.m. here in Mountain Standard Time. And the current price of Bitcoin is $20,000 and some change. Uh, it's been doing a lot of ups and downs in the last 24 hours. So we're not even going to talk about what, what it is up or down. It's, it is where it is. Sats per dollar is almost 5,000. Loving that. Loving how cheap it is to buy some Bitcoin. Uh, so last week, we, uh, we talked about how Bitcoin is the buying opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, then it dips some more. And uh, we're in even a better buying position. There's been some things that have happened. Uh, before we get into it, Marcus and I were talking about Bitcoin and we were talking about reserve assets. And so we wanted to have the Bitcoiners Guide Tip of the Week brought to you by mfmerch.com, the best merch in Bitcoin. Uh, swag. Your swag, buy your merch, or don't buy it. All right? You don't have to buy it. It's just cool stuff. Uh, so here I am, I'm going to share my screen right now, and this is just in Investopedia, so take it for what it is, maybe it's awesome, maybe it sucks, you'll be, the, you'll be able to decide that. So to understand what is a reserve asset, because Marcus was asking, and then it got me thinking to him, can Bitcoin be a reserve asset? Well, what's the definition of a reserve asset? Uh, reserve assets are financial assets denominated in foreign currencies and held by central banks that are primarily used to balance payments. Key, take, key takeaways. Reserve assets are currencies or other assets such as gold that can be readily transferable and are used to balance international transactions and payments. A reserve asset must be readily available. Physical, this is where we got on the debate, is Bitcoin physical or not? Controlled by policymakers and easily transferable. And then it goes on to say the US dollar is a reserve currency, meaning it is widely held as a reserve asset around the world. But what's interesting, because it says it has to be physical, um, but you think about the dollar being the world reserve currency uh and then when we put the sh the sanctions on russia uh all of a sudden russia didn't have access to its us dollar or us dollar denominated reserves so it goes to show that even us reserves aren't physical because if they were physical and they were holding them then the us wouldn't be able to sanction those reserves from the russians uh, or maybe i'm wrong or maybe they just wrote down all the serial numbers from the dollars that they sent to Russia. I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
What do you think, Marcus? I'm really wondering, like, who makes these definitions, right? Is it like a bunch of Keynesians sitting together in like some ivory tower somewhere deciding uh, that the ad it needs to be physical, right? I don't know. I, I haven't studied economics, so it's a question that, that, that I wonder, and shouldn't it be updated now that we've, uh, you know, the discovery of digital assets since, since Bitcoin's inception? Yes, I so think. So are we just looking, but that's one, that's one part of it. So, you know, this definition that we're looking at, you know, is probably from like legacy, legacy world. Yes. So probably need some updating, but just in general, right? Even like forget what like the definition on Wikipedia or Investopedia or whatever it says, right? It's like, if I think about like a reserve asset, I think about, you know, <laughs> for, for some reason I have to think about a barn and you're living like, you know, off grid or whatever. And you just want to have some safe stuff, whether it's gold, you know, I see gold as a reserve asset, right? Uh, it could be even be like a stockpile of wood or a stockpile of like oil, maybe, right? It's like, yeah. it's just an asset, you know, it'll always maintain some value. There's always going to be buyers for it. You know, that's to me, that's what I would have expected from like a definition of something you can hold as a reserve that you can just, and preferably like, that is just not hedged or that's not linked to like the current money, right? Because if you get like a downturn in stocks and money, you want to have some asset, you know, hidden away, tucked away for later as a savings, like a reserve asset. That's what I think of. And yes. then, I, then I think it like Bitcoin seems like the perfect reserve asset to me. You know, it meets a lot of the definitions. Okay, it's not physical, but in a sense it is, right? Because you can actually store your Bitcoin physically on a hardware wallet or on a piece of paper or even in your head. So it can actually take on both forms, you know, you can, yeah. And it's, it's really, truly a bearer asset. So whoever holds that, that you know, those 24 yeah. words yeah. really holds, you know, so you can, you can, yeah, you can argue about whether it's digital or physical, but I, I think they're both. So that's where the discussion came. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. I think Bitcoin is more digital, obviously, than it is physical. There are no, so anyone who's new to this thing, there are no little coin Bitcoins that look like little gold coins that are going around. So don't go buying those if someone's trying to sell you that. Um, but you can store your keys physically. And, and in reality, that is like you don't own a Bitcoin or Bitcoins that like you don't own those. You have you have access to the keys of the UTXO set or of the UTXOs. So that's a little technical to start out with. Uh, but yeah, what's a UTXO, Sean? <laughs> it's an unspent transaction output. Um, what does that mean? That just basically means uh, you buy Bitcoin, you have it in your wallet or in your address the unspent transaction outputs that are in there, all of those that you've bought, they comprise your total stack. And um, that's what you have. That's your Bitcoin. So um, it's kind of interesting. It's uh, if you want to study up on it, just Google it. It's pretty easy, easy stuff. Uh, Good call. It, yeah. If you look a little bit further, so this is what's pretty funny about Investopedia. And I guess, when I think of Investopedia, I think of like uh, all your your current economists, and then I and then I see all my economists, my Keynesians, and then I see all and then I see Michael Saylor, and he's just and he's just saying to all of them, your models are broken, and Bitcoin in my mind is rewriting the history books. It's rewriting all of these books, and everything and all these models that have been put out in the past, including what is a reserve currency? Um, because it's something new. You can't, how, do you, how does it fit? You can't put Bitcoin in a box. And I think that's what all these people try to do is they look at it and they go, well, the closest thing that it looks like to me is a stock. And then they go, well, there's no cash flow. There's no, there's no earnings. Um, it, it, there's no, there's nothing. So it's a fraud. And then they go, there's no way it can be money because, um, it's too volatile to be money. Right. That's like the, just the easy cop-outs that economists have. 
And so it's funny here if you go, okay, well, historically reserve assets as per the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, which we don't care too much for the IMF, the balance of payments manual must at a minimum comprise the following financial assets. Gold, foreign currencies, Bitcoin may constitute as a foreign currency. It's a neutral currency <laughs> and it's not by any state. So it's technically a foreign currency. Um, the currencies must be tradable, can buy, sell anywhere such as USD or Euro. That fits the definition of Bitcoin. Special drawing rights, those are SDRs. Uh, this is so funny, right? Because the SDR is literally just like paper money. Yes, like paper money <laughs> to a T. <laughs> just like made up, made up funny money. You know, it's just like yeah. Google it. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Represent rights to obtain foreign exchange or other reserve assets from other IMF members. So that's proof of stake on steroids. <laughs> Whoever decides that, oh, we, we have the money, great. Now you have those SDRs. You have the special drawing rights. You're special. Um, and then a reserve position with the IMF. Reserves the country has given to the IMF that are readily available to the member country. Okay. Um, so conclusion for the Bitcoiners Guide Tip of the Week. Can Bitcoin be the world reserve asset? Marcus, do you think that that is something that Bitcoin can do? Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. And I really like your point about Bitcoin rewriting history. I think that is spot on and probably like <laughs> underrated tweet right there. <laughs> All because the, it's, 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 already, it's, a, it's already happened, right? Like we literally have rewritten history already and we're just getting started. Yes. And to answer your second question, yeah, definitely. I completely can see, but obviously, man. I mean, we're here at the Bitcoiners Guide, but yeah, it's it's like you said, it's a it's a win all take all money, and the game theory kind of like <laughs> dictates that ultimately, Bitcoin being the most scarce and hardest, unfuckable, unchangeable uh, money, making it the hardest, scarcest thing, and you, that, which we're going to measure everything against. There is no better tool. There's no better measurement stick to do that with. And because it's so tight and so fixed in, in, in its being, yeah, it makes it a perfect tool. It makes it a perfect reserve asset. It makes sense to price everything in Bitcoin. It'll make for better calculation, better economic calculation through time. Uh, there won't be any uh, inflation. Well, there will be some inflation, but it will be perfectly known. You know, we know it through the halvings and the block rewards that have been laid out since since the first block. So, yes, yeah, definitely. I can definitely see it being a reserve. And it's going to get there slowly. In a sense, it's already a reserve asset because, you know, El Salvador has put it, you know, they're, they're using it as a reserve asset, literally. They, mm -hmm. they're, they've, it's a sovereign state that's been buying Bitcoin. Um, I don't know exactly how they're custodying it, um, but they are custodying it physically sean <laughs> and uh yeah it, it, so i you know it's kind of like uh, nuriel rubini saying bitcoin is not a currency yeah until it is right until it literally yes. became a currency and he's still saying no it's not a currency so <laughs> investopedia which is clearly underwriting the imf definition so you know um, they're going to deny it's a reserve currency and they'll 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 be like that um, They'll deny it until they just can't deny it anymore. But then it'll be too late. Yeah, it, it makes me think of, I saw this tweet from some macro dude and he had a chart of Bitcoin and a chart of avocados for like the last two years. And apparently avocados have, have gone up faster. Um, well, not up faster, but have steadily, not because of Bitcoin's quote unquote crash uh, to 20,000, which two years ago, Bitcoin at 20,000 would have looked amazing. And it did look amazing when we got to 20,000 a year and a half ago. Um, but the run up that Bitcoin has had from two years ago and avocados have had a bigger run up, not when Bitcoin is at 69K, but now that it's down at 20,000. Um, and so then he goes, Bitcoin's not an inflation hedge. Avocados are an inflation hedge. And I think it's just, 
I think these economists and he's just, you know, he's just poking fun. Obviously he doesn't believe in Bitcoin or he doesn't under, and he doesn't understand it, but at the same time, he's, he's making a joke that he thinks is funny. Like he thinks this is a, a witty joke and the Bitcoiners, it's like, the, it's a tale as old as time. You know, it was, I think even Rubini said that olives were a better inflation hedge. I think there's some, there's some bank in Italy that uses cheese. I think they have ch- cheese reserves that they keep refrigerated. Oh, yeah. In uh, Canada, they have uh, maple syrup reserves. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a real thing to have a vault with like maple syrup. Yeah. And so you, you just like look at these economists and they, and they try to box Bitcoin in. And, th- and this is the biggest issue is that you can't box Bitcoin in. All your models are broken. Bitcoin is rewriting the history books. You can't box it into being an inflation hedge. Like that's not what it is. And yes, there's a 21 million cap, but it's much more than an inflation hedge. You can't box it into being blockchain technology because every crypto and its mom out there has blockchain technology. So you can't box it into that. You can't box it into being a stock. You can't, like it's just, it's a new money and um lynn alden tweeted this out uh she said if bitcoin doesn't fail which she in her tweets it seems like she believes that it won't because it hasn't and it continues to move forward if bitcoin doesn't fail and continues to maintain key crypto market share then watch out money is a zero sum contest only the deepest most liquid, most fungible, most portable, most uncensorable, and most resistant to debasement survive, Bitcoin is leading there. Uh, so when you talk about Bitcoin being this new money, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not created to just be like the fastest Visa payment thing out there, which it'll, it will do with the Lightning Network, but it's meant to survive as the base layer. So it's supposed to be this granite rock foundation. And that's what a lot of people miss when, they, when they're thinking about what Bitcoin is. It's supposed to be a foundation so strong that even a nuclear fallout doesn't break it. And a nuclear fallout wouldn't, wouldn't stop Bitcoin. And, uh, and then if you go, okay, then if you move backwards, then it, if it can do that, then it's the hardest money, it's the best money. And it's a zero sum contest, as Lynn Alden says, which means all money, it trends to one and people will end up using the best money out there. Yeah, and we'll see, right? So Bitcoin is only like uh, since 2009, so it's like 13 years old. I mean, it's in some sense, it's still an experiment. You know, nobody really knows what's going to happen. I mean, what is the like before Bitcoin? I guess the US dollar wasn't that like a zero sum game as well? So why what didn't like the whole world just like switch to the dollar completely? Yeah, that's a good point. What do you think? I just, I'm, I'm just, I just like to take the counter argument now. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that is a good, that is a really good point. I would, I mean, I would say because governments have power over money currently, but in a Bitcoin, in a Bitcoinized world, then there'll be separation of money and state. So then I think that's when you really see governments switching to, well, everyone switching to Bitcoin. Like when gold was around, different societies or civilizations used gold and they didn't even know that they were using, they didn't even know each other and they were still using gold as their money. Because it tends to one, son. Yeah, gold is still around. (laughs) Why isn't gold like the number one money? Because gold always and then, needs and the then gold. Yeah. Gold's price is manipulated. I always hear, but you know, it's like, okay, how is it being manipulated? I can't explain it. What I do know, of course, is like there's a lot more gold in the ground left. You know, so maybe yeah, Uganda. I mean, it's it, it's supply. been a it's it's been a pretty damn neat trick how they got people all like to hand in their gold money, you know, and just swap it around for like worthless pieces of paper, basically. And we all trust that uh, that that paper has some is backed by some value somewhere in a vault of a bank, which we all know 
hasn't been the case like since what 1971 in the in the United States. Yeah. So uh, yeah, like what kind of world are we living in? Maybe money doesn't require you know like a real asset behind it, or it makes you think of the Yap stones, you know, where like people just knew it was like a public ledger, right? All these big stones in the middle of the village, everybody knew whose stone belonged to whom, you know? And yeah. it's, I don't know, it's, it's such a weird, such a weird construct. It is weird because we're used to having money that it needs to be backed by something, but then you go, okay, well, what was gold backed by? Right. What was gold backed by? It was backed by the monetary properties of gold, of it being scarce, of it being fungible, portable, somewhat portable, right? Resistant to debasement. It was That's, scarce and hard and made it made it hard to obtain. Yeah. I guess absolutely. it was it was that also made it desirable, you know, because yeah. not everybody could have it. And it and it had some shiny features, you know, if you think back on like the olden days, you know, they would decorate buildings in such a way as a, you know, or, or. Yeah, exactly. And so then you go, okay, well, Bitcoin, people go, well, what's Bitcoin backed by? It's not backed by, like, okay, you could say it's backed by code, it's backed by math, it's backed by the miners, but in reality, it's the bare asset. Bitcoin is the bare asset. So it's backed by nothing. It doesn't need to be backed by something. It's not fiat currency. It's sound hard currency. It doesn't need to have a backing. It it's backed. It's money, and it's and the what it's backed by is the sound properties of money that it exhibits. It's it's verifiability. You know, you don't need to trust. It's it's completely verifiable. Anybody can run their own node, look at the blockchain, see all the transactions since the beginning confirm that there's like no more than 21 million bitcoin yes. that it you know and that nobody can cheat it and then if you know hey you know the money is good there's this fixed amount that you know that everybody's playing according to the rules of, of the protocol i guess that's that's what's backing it in in your argument here exactly because when when you talk about fiat being backed by gold all that it meant was if i take this if i take this note this dollar note, and I take it to the bank, I can exchange that note for do- for gold, for a fixed amount of gold. And that's why it's yeah. backed by gold, because there's a fixed amount, there's a fixed exchange rate that I'll get for something real. And, but if you had gold, then you wouldn't need to have your gold backed by anything, because it is the reserve asset. It is the thing that everything else is trying to peg itself to which we've learned over time no currency can ever be pegged to another currency we learned that with luna a couple weeks ago we learned that in 2015 when switzerland tried to peg itself to the euro and then it just said screw this we're out and then the euro dropped like 20 30 percent overnight um we learned that 1971 when the dollar was unpegged from gold you just can't peg one currency to another. It does not work. It won't work. In the long run, the the depegging will always come around. <laughs> the, the so imagine imagine this, Sean. Imagine there's a, a, somebody that has like a printing machine and can make the perfect US dollars. They can print like hundred dollar bills, like you know, perfectly. There's no way to. I know they got serial codes and whatnot. It's just as a thought experiment, right? So yeah. So now these bills are like perfectly, you know, like on, on, you know, you can't see the difference. How much, how much would that counterfeiter be able to print without like consequence? Are we talking just some random, like me, if I had one? So if you had a printer, right, you could probably print up like a million bucks, spend it, you know, and nobody would ever know. You know it wouldn't cause inflation, right? What happens if you if you had like such a big production that you can print like 40% of all the US dollars in circulation? Well, like I'm... at what point will people notice like, hey, wait a minute, there's like a lot of money in circulation? Probably probably when I when I start buying all these fancy fancy citadels yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's more there's Germany. more to it right yeah someone will notice uh, point being right is like what would i just buy a know, if, Bitcoin? if if people knew that there were like a couple of people around the world that were just like debasing the, that they have this money printer you know and they they can't really do anything about it because this printer is so good it looks exactly the same but, of course, you know, the U.S. would probably change their dollar, you know, their dollar bills, recall all the old ones and like make new ones again. But the idea is it, it would cause unrest, right? People would start losing trust in the dollar because they're like, hey, this could be a counterfeit dollar. We don't know anymore. Yeah. They but, would, they yeah, would, but if not, the government, if the, if the government does it, if the government printed 40% out of nowhere, then we all are like, okay, this is fine. <laughs> yeah, it's no problem. <laughs> The dog in the That's burning right. room. This is fine. Yeah. That meme. Yeah. If you or me did it, it would people would say this isn't fair. Uh, but if the government does it, then it's good monetary policy. That's what people think. Speaking but, of monetary policy, what did the Fed do this week? We had a Fed meeting. I know you love watching that stuff. So. <laughs> I did watch it. Um, and the the Fed came out. They raised the federal funds rate. 75 basis points, which is three fourths of a percent. Uh, it's in a gap, it's in a range now of 1.5 to 1.75, um, or no, one point, yeah, 1.5, 1.7, or 1.25 to 1.5. Uh, either way, they raised it 75 basis points. And uh, they're, the reason why they're doing this is because they're trying to look serious. They want to get respect a lot of people have lost respect of the central bank of the United States because of current inflation levels. So they're trying to gain back respect, trying to gain back the narrative. Um, according to Jerome Powell, it seems like their, their number one thing that they're trying to do is, is to get inflation down. And that there seems like to me, at least that the fed is willing to risk high unemployment or losses of jobs and a recession or a depression to get inflation under control. That's the stance that they're taking currently. Uh, I don't think that that stance will last forever. I think that they'll end up choosing to debase the currency, but right now they're barking loud and saying we're gonna we're willing to go through high unemployment, we're willing to go through a recession or depression if we can raise rates and get inflation under control. The problem is I don't think raising rates is gonna get inflation under control. And so when they see that, they're gonna say, well, what are we doing this for? Let's lower the interest rates, print more money because it doesn't even matter. And then we're gonna really see inflation go through the roof. And um, and you're gonna, it's it's gonna be, it's gonna be a wild ride. I think this this decade is gonna be a wild ride of inflation. I think you should stock up on your Bitcoin and you should stock up on food supplies as well. Cause when there's high inflation, there's gonna be shortages everywhere. So and maybe even stock up on some ammunition if you're in the US. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get out of it? They also talked about the CBDC, which kind of like we were talking about earlier with reserve assets would you what, what were your thoughts on the on the cbdc talk that they had or i i just thought it was just such a you know it it's always like little baby steps right and it's like little moves every time but it's to me it's like such a milestone again to hear like the federal reserve now saying that they're going to look into cbdc right i mean they didn't say they were actually going to make one but you know they've been yeah. talking about it a little bit before but now here you have you know jerome powell head of the federal reserve saying yeah um and i wish i we had uh, maybe we can edit it in here but we had uh, that little clip from um, from jerome powell where where he actually makes those statements okay because there there's some there's some line in there where he says something to the tune of um to see if we can improve upon an already efficiently and perfectly working dollar system. <laughs> you know? like, it's like, like the whole, it's, it's just, to me, it's so funny because like four years ago or maybe five years ago, they wouldn't 
you know, they literally just ignored us, you know, then they laughed at us. And now they're like, you know, they're I'm he's excited. literally saying, seeing the growth of the cryptocurrency space is like, yeah, see, we told you so, you know, a couple of years, we're going to be too big to, to, to deny, you know, you cannot, the, the, Bitcoin forces them to, to have to look at this thing. They want to look away. They want to dismiss it. But Bitcoin doesn't care, you know, and the adoption has been growing massively. There have been a massive wave of new users. Fortunately, a lot of people get burned, and that's the way people learn about crypto and about Bitcoin. And, you know, to, but it's getting so big, and they're really worried. And now they're even forced into looking at a central bank digital currency, <laughs> which wouldn't even exist without Bitcoin, that. right? Because the idea behind it is like, what we should look at Investopedia, what is the CBDC, right? Because it's probably something blockchain, blockchain, something. Yes. <laughs> but it's just, it's just, it's just a database. It's nothing different from the current system, except that, yeah, when, I mean, what is the difference, right? What, it just doesn't make sense. It's like a solution looking, or like, what is it? Like a solution looking for a problem. It's, it's a joke. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of, it's kind of really fun to watch as they're now going to make a CBDC and it's just a wrapper. It's just like marketing speak because it doesn't mean anything right now. I mean, they're going to come up with some, whatever the technical solution is for what they're looking for is not going to, it won't matter, you know, yeah. the digital, because the digital they're, dollar, they're, whatever they call it. They're, they will always be the ones having the button to, to print more money, create more, and redistribute that wealth. That that will be the underpinning of any CBDC they come up with, which is the complete opposite of what Bitcoin is, right? It's like nobody yes. controls the money supply. And it's, you know, it's a fair way and for everybody fair in the same way to get more. You can start mining. You can expend energy like anybody else and get your Bitcoin by expending that energy. And, or you can buy it from somebody else, but nobody can create more. Nobody can change the protocol. Nobody. And that is not what a CBDC is. A CBDC just means that the people in power are gonna stay in power. They're gonna decide who gets the money, who gets the bailouts and who won't get the bailouts. And they're just gonna keep distorting the economy. So there's, and, uh, you know, like the dollar is already digital. Come on, you know, everybody in the United States pays digitally. So it's it's not like all of a sudden we're going to go from analog money to digital money. That There's no improvement there as well. So they, like you said, you know, they just have to react. I don't know. The, it, difference, it, the difference is that they take the banks out of it. That's all it is. Now you have a direct relationship between central right. bank and end consumer. Or before it's central bank, commercial bank, in consumer. So who's going to lose in a CBDC? The banks are going to lose big time. So the banks are going to be some of the first big institutions to realize that Bitcoin. But don't the banks don't was, the banks save own the, the banks own the Fed, right? I mean, yes, the Fed owned private, by the commercial private, banks. It is privately owned. This is going to be interesting. I, I don't know exactly the whole makeup. I don't know the makeup. Sam Callahan is really good. He works at Swan Bitcoin. He knows a lot more about the, the intricacies of how the Fed is built up and the, and the Bank of International Settlements, which is like the central bank's central bank. Um, I don't know all that, but I know enough. And what I do foresee, this is what I don't like too. Is it's gonna go from the dollar how it is to the CBDC? They're gonna realize that's broken too because there's still gonna be inflation or probably even more inflation, and the, your your dollars will probably disappear. They'll probably have like a time limit on how much you can like. Oh, if you don't spend this month, you're gonna get UBI for this month. If you don't spend it, then you lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. And they're gonna keep doing that, and then people and then there's gonna be a bunch of inflation. And uh, eventually people are going to go to Bitcoin and then the governments will go to Bitcoin too, even the yeah. big countries. And what they'll say is just how we said that Bitcoin re rewrites these history books. They're going to rewrite the history books too. They're going to say, we always believed in Bitcoin. We always knew that Bitcoin was 
where we were going to go to. We had to make these uh we had to make these uh initial steps to go from the dollar to the cbdc and now we're using bitcoin so um as as a hodler as a true bitcoiner it's gonna be annoying to hear that like it's gonna be super annoying because you're gonna be like no you didn't you guys are you guys are just making this up you guys did not foresee this you were doing the exact opposite and wrong thing but the reason why you Bitcoin is because you can hop out of that matrix, hop out of that fake world. And the reward is you get to get to hold Bitcoin earlier and you get there before all the smart people in the world realize it, before all the dumb people in the world realize it, before all the governments realize it, you get there first. So that's the whole point is you're rewarded with it. But the reward <laughs> The reward, like volatility is the price you pay along this reward. So you got to handle the volatility and you just have to be at that Bitcoin Zen. Don't go trading it, trying to think that you're a genius, that you're going to make more. Don't go shorting it. Don't go selling it. Just work your job, save in Bitcoin and wake up in 10 years from now and watch how much your life has changed. Nice rant. Yeah, sorry. I agree. Sorry, I got to stop ranting. It's too many oh, rants. Yeah, it was good. Um, That's what we're here for. Yeah. It's our show, goddammit. We can rant whatever we want. <laughs> yeah. To all the 30 listeners out there. <laughs> yeah. To all the millions of listeners, the millions and millions. And in front of the millions <laughs> of. It's you know, guides. like. It kind of feels like imagine like the government always had um, television, right? Or let's say like the printing press, and then all of a sudden the internet comes along, and they can no longer. I mean, they can still like lay claim or push their monopoly and send their messages out on TV, right? And be like, look, this is the this is our official message. But as everybody gets access to this free and open internet and people can just like search for their own information, you know, it's like slowly but surely that 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 authority and that that massive reach and impact they have through like that mainstream media gets diluted and you know, people just at a certain point just stop watching the eight o'clock news, right? So that part that that tool is taken away from them. I think with money it's gonna be the same thing. They're gonna hang on to like their no, 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 we make the money, you know? Yeah, but now there's this free and open Bitcoin out there. Yeah. <laughs> and it actually has better properties than your shitty money. <laughs> so yes. I'm going to just, and they're just going to, they're just going to see it. They're just going to see the power slip away from them slowly. And you're saying, oh, at one point they'll have to admit it. Yeah, but they might put up a fight first as well. You know, some countries might try to ban it or seize it or yeah. forbid you to, transacted and we're going to see some funny things around the world going on so be careful out there keep your keys uh off the exchanges and um i think i think yeah, a CBDC, i think a CBDC is a fight a CBDC, What's that? i think a cbdc is like that's part of fighting bitcoin in my mind yeah but I, i'm not i'm totally not worried about a cbdc <laughs> Yeah, if they want to waste their time on like developing and like spending resources on building a CBDC, good luck. You know, I know, especially a government. Like, what, what <laughs> government can get something done in under ten years? Like, you're gonna build something? Yeah. Sorry, I don't. I mean, maybe they will. Yeah, and and you know, like to Michael Saylor point, he made this point like in this podcast uh, earlier. Michael Saylor with. Uh, Sven. Oh, that was with the no, with the um, Northman trader. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sven Hendrik. Yeah, Sven Hendrik. You're right. And he's like, yeah, you know, uh, what? What's the market cap of Facebook right now? You know, or what's the market cap of Apple right now? And if I were to give you that amount of money, I don't know what the market cap of Apple is right now, but let's say it's like five hundred okay. billion or something. If yeah. I were to give yeah. you five hundred billion dollars, could you recreate like an Apple? like an Apple company with the same network effects and strength and stuff. No, oh. you know, it's like same thing, you know, with the U S government, good luck, you know, you, you'll need like a trillion dollars <laughs> to build this thing. 
and then still you won't have the network effect you still lose so yeah, yeah. the this, the cbdc is that is that would you look at it as like jeff booth's analogy of adding candy aisles to netflix yeah absolutely it's just yeah. that your last it's the last grab before it all fails that's like yeah. that's what the cbdc is no don't use our dollars use our digital i've seen dollars, it you know? i've seen it i've seen it in other businesses as well i used to work yeah. in, uh, in media and marketing right and some of some clients were really you know like forward looking and proactive and innovative but you also had like these brick and mortar companies you know like uh, they there were several of them there was some were selling like literally like the toy stores others were like um uh, you had uh, obviously like what did you just mention the the, the video stores you remember uh, the little VHS i think stores? i think i said i think i said netflix but i meant to say blockbuster yeah, you meant the blockbuster yeah, yeah you know where people used to come to rent their vhs and then they got competition from Netflix and online streaming, you know, and they see the, the number of people and rentals declining. So they decided, you know what, if we add like a bunch of food and snacks and candy, then maybe we could recoup some of those. <laughs> but yeah, then, then you're just turning your shop into like a, a candy shop, right? So it's, you might as well. Yeah, it's a, cheap, it's a cheap gimmick. It's just a cheap the gimmick. Thing is, yeah, here here was this company in the Netherlands, you know, they have all these brick and mortar stores where they sell like fridges, televisions and that kind yeah. of stuff. And I think there were about like three or four bigger chains in the Netherlands that, you know, comprised like 90% of the market share of all those goods being sold in the Netherlands. Until you got like these uh, things like uh, like Amazon, but then the Dutch version, you know, like this, this, this is one winner here. Yeah. Um, and there's this bigger mega store, right? But it was especially like the online shopping and online researching, you know, where people would walk into the store and then they would look for the feel the product, they like like it, and then they would go at home and look online to shop for the best deal, right? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. But all these stores, they had these, yeah, dinosaur, dinosaur management teams, you know, who just ignored this storm for like the first 10 years. And then yeah. when it was too late and they had to face it and recognize the, the numbers going down, that's when they said, okay, we need a website, you know? And then, um, yeah. but because all these stores were their own stores, they're like, all right, so there's a website, but um, if somebody wants to order something from, um, like, I'm just going to say as if it's in the US, like somebody from New York orders, then that sale is actually would have been my store in New York sale. So that person is supposed to get it. So they were trying to fit this online model onto these existing stores and they doesn't work. I, I was, they, it, yeah, that's what I imagine the federal reserve building a CBDC, you know, like looking like, like it's, uh, yeah. they're, they're going to try to fit like this, this, yeah, something that doesn't fit and they're going to lose. Yeah. I it's just remember. like also, also in the airline industry, you know, like, um, we have KLM, which is like a royal uh, uh, airline here Airlines. in the Netherlands. And, yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know, true legacy, they have like these massive buildings, you know, and like these massive fleets and high prices and quality. And then these companies like Ryanair and these online budget airlines started, Ryanair popping up, started murder, murder. Yeah, they suck, but they, they were murdering the, the online game, you know? And, yes. And, and these the legacy KLM companies... Built. Yeah, they, they had like way too much staff and they weren't like flexible or agile to, to pivot, you know, so. Yeah, to me, that's what's going on here as well. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Word to the wise, if you're ever in Europe, don't fly Ryanair. They <laughs> or if you do, oh, yeah. make sure you figure out how to. Or easy or easy jet <laughs> or easy jet would have been a better, uh, you know. <laughs> Make sure you figure out how to check in two hours before because if the app doesn't let you and then you show up and you try to check in, they charge you 75 euros if you don't check in two hours before your flight. That's how they get do you, you. Do you book like uh, two airline seats, like the seat in front of you, so you got extra leg space? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't need to do that. I, but I do like to upgrade to, to like a business class. If it's not, if I can.
or sometimes the the person checking me in will just be like well you're tall and they'll put me in an aisle seat or they'll put me in a in an exit row that's the best like how tall are you are you like twice as tall as a normal average human or no I'm not that tall <laughs> i'm like i'm six seven so whatever how tall is a normal guy is what five eight average guy in the world maybe five eight so no, no, i can't do it. i i don't know how to do the conversion to i'm about a foot metric. taller what what is uh what's the average height of a guy in centimeters depends what country okay well in the world i don't know yeah. dude well, now you got me wondering, so I'm gonna just look it up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess it's like 175 or something. Okay, average height of a man in the world. No, a little taller, 182. Ooh. Okay, average height of a man in the world. Okay, what did you say? I don't know, 175 to 182, something like that. Bro, come on, that's t- you're li- you've lived in in the in Amsterdam for too long in the Netherlands because there's tall people <laughs> up there. Right. You're forgetting about like all of the like asian countries too. watch out now watch out now <laughs> well they're just they're shorter people out there that's all i'm saying true that's true and in germany America, people pretty... are taller and in amsterdam and netherlands yeah. people are taller but in the asian oh, country, there you go people that's, are shorter. that's my bias you're right that's my bias so what, what is it 170 okay well now i gotta do the conversion so it's five five feet seven and a half inches so what's that conversion conversion hold on conversion from centimeters to inches <laughs> it's like the best bitcoin show ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah because we got to figure this out okay how many inches is five seven five times five times 12 60 plus seven how many sats per dollar sean <laughs> while you look that up I'll, I'll look up how much the sats per dollar are I we're, mean, almost at, we we're almost at go, 5, 000, we're almost at 5,000 sats per dollar. We know t- we need really need to go to like a sat standard. Dude. Like it's like $200, $200 buys you a million sats. Okay, so for that, our, that is what people need to hear. Yeah, how many, how much? You get a how million far, How far does a million you know? sats? I think, I think a million sets should kind of be the standard that you look at because that's more digestible because sets per dollar, you're like 5,000 sets per dollar. What does that mean? But if you're like, I got a million sets and that's costing me about $200 and people are like, okay, that's, that's, un, that's digestible. That's okay. easier, right? Than sets yes. per dollar because, yeah. I agree. I think a million sets is, should be, not necessarily the standard. Obviously, one set set should be the standard, but a or, minute, or, yeah. or yeah, it's just easier. Hundred dollars, hundred dollars buys you half a million sets. Because who's buying one? Sets. Who's buying sets at one dollar? Like who's buying one dollar of sets? Maybe people that are like on yet. hourly, an hourly PPA. No, but people also you got a unit bias, right? People are like, oh, I I want to have a Bitcoin. Yeah, but like a Bitcoin is so far out of reach for so many people. It's kind of uh, back in very... reach for some people, though. It got back <laughs> into reach. It's very healthy for people to buy two hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. Yeah? yeah, if you do that every week or every month, you'll be you'll be in a pretty good place in a in a decade. Yeah, that's true. So going back to the average height of a man in the world, yeah, 60, 67 and a half inches, which is five foot seven and a half. That's 171 and a half centimeters. 171. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty. 171 centimeters. I guess I'm not as tall as you, but um, you're probably I guess you're over. You're over 200 centimeters. Yeah, I'm like right at 200, 200, 201 centimeters. Okay. Yeah, I'm 195. Yeah, you're a tall, dude. Just like my avatar shows. <laughs> Your little kid on a kiddo <laughs> on on a DJ. Okay, let's uh, let's get back into the crazy things that are going on. Should we go into three AC or into? So let's just do both of those. Actually, we'll do them at the same time. You like the organization of this show? Bitmex. So here's something from Decrypt.co. No idea who they are. They sound cool. 
that they sound kind of like altcoin to whatever. BitMEX and others exiting three arrows capital. That's three AC amid three AC insolvency fears. Three AC is a um, it's a darling among crypto investment firms for years. So if you don't know what three AC is, I guess that's what it is. I had never heard of it before. Compared to something like uh, you know, like you know, Ark Invest or you know, like all these funds. And yeah. Somebody's managing it, and they're usually a guru or some smart traders with a lot of inside connections or some kind of alpha. Yeah. Probably yeah. like a, like a Galaxy Digital, maybe something like that with Novigrads. Okay, here's here's what they say. We'll read these three paragraphs. So uh, on Tuesday. It emerged that 3AC had begun selling off assets, including $40 million worth of its Lido staked Ethereum, which is ST ETH staked Ethereum. It's also widely believed, although still unconfirmed, that 3AC has been trying to keep a $264 million AV loan and $35 million compound loan from going into liquidation. 3AC also had heavy Terra exposure. That's a bad thing to have when Terra goes to zero. When Do Quan or Don't Quan, according to Corey Clipston, uh, when his Luna Foundation guard LFG, let's freaking get out of here, made another $1.5 billion Bitcoin purchase on May 5th to prop up Terra's stablecoin reserves, it was with the help of 3AC. BitMEX on Friday confirmed that it liquidated three. Arrows Capital 3AC's position this week. Just yesterday, BitMEX co-founder Benjamin Dilo reached a $10 million settlement with the CFTC, that's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, to avoid prison time over failure to establish, implement, and maintain AML, anti-money laundering program. So basically, uh, it looks like 3AC, they made a huge, uh, they were exposed to Terra, this is, this is how cascading, if one person goes under, then another person goes under because there is counterparty risk. One person owes money to another, but they go bankrupt. Now I'm expecting money back. Well, now I can't pay my bills because I'm not getting paid my, you know, my, what people should be owing me. And uh, that's how things cascade. And who knows who has high exposure to 3AC. So if someone has high exposure to 3AC, then they might, uh, get liquidated as well it's crazy stuff. Yeah, what's staggering what's staggering is the numbers right we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars and yes. billions of dollars you know luna was what like 1.5 2.5 billion or you know like it's it's in like the the multiple of billion so that's thousands of millions of, of dollars that are being liquidated evaporated and j just to try to keep it really simple for for, for people like what's happening here right yeah. so bitcoin is going to go on a bull run that creates all this excitement about and draws new invest new investors in yes these shitcoin promoters nft promoters new crypto coin x promoters doggy coin I, promoter I they know these new people are coming in right and they put their marketing teams to work to catch all those people on youtube and start funneling money into their platforms mm -hmm. so these projects start to grow and start to lift so now these projects they go to like hedge funds and with their beautiful marketing speakers they're like look this thing is going to go to the moon and you guys we're going to give you a special deal yada 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 everybody's investing like madmen it's all going great as the bull run is continuing and prices keep going up yeah and these assets these fake assets and even bitcoin like over inflates right and then the market sentiment shifts, people get scared. It starts with a small sell off, then, you know, some bigger wheels start getting out. And all of a sudden, these, these, they, they, they were like, wait a minute, we might have been too bullish. We thought Bitcoin would have keep going to at least 100K. Uh, all these alts are blowing up way too soon. <laughs> people get nervous. You know, some big billionaire investor said, hey, I want my money out of this investment I did with you. Yeah. Now they're under collateralized mm -hmm. uh, and it becomes this musical chair games of who can get out first <laughs> before the other. 
and who has exposure to what, right? And some people think they're safe, but then it turns out that one of their clients was exposed to this, so now they're also exposed to it. And it becomes this domino effect of people going bankrupt, not able to pay back their, their loans and losing a lot of money. Yeah. And that's that's what we've seen happening. One failure, Luna, led to the next, you know, now A3AC is in trouble. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing that in, in like Wall Street pretty soon as well, because as the, you know, like the, the stocks and the equities and everything, and we see the mortgage rate starts going up once people starting to default on their mortgage payments, you know, we're going to see the same type of stuff go on. And to add on this, just as when Bitcoin is pumping, people are talking about price manipulation and whales are pumping and then dumping. Yeah, there's some of those sharks and really smart guys trying to do that. Also on the way down, uh, Sean. So some of these guys know that, hey, there's a lot of money made to short some of these coins or stocks or whatever. So if they can scare a company or, you know, that's that they think is oh, this one is about to crack or might be in trouble or they can even spread the the idea that they might be in trouble. That can cause like a dumping of that coin already. And while they're short, somebody can make a lot of money off of it. So, yeah, it's it's a it's <laughs> it's a dog eat dog world out there. <laughs> and the best thing to do is just not participate in it. Just get your Bitcoin at whatever price you think is good. And um, stay away from all this, um, all these, all these big boys fighting each other, pushing the price up, pushing it down. In the long run, it doesn't matter because in the long run, there's only that 21 million. And it's going to adopt to to a mass population. But in yeah, in the short term, don't get caught up in thinking you know what's going to happen because there's some really, really. I mean, there there were even some real rumors going around that like some of these uh, sharks were trying to like get Michael Saylor to, to some liquidation price, right? Where yes. they tried to turn somebody into a forced seller. I mean, yeah, exactly. You never know what kind of information they have. So you can never be sure that it's impossible, but you know, it, it, it's important to know that these things do go on on the background and yeah. And yeah. as soon as something gets liquidated, then yeah, things can switch around really fast as well. So it's kind of exciting to be honest. <laughs> and there's no point in feeling bad about oh I should have sold at 69. Yeah, now that we're here, it's very easy for you to look back and you can say exactly where you could should have sold. Right. That's not how the price works, obviously. If we all knew that, it's it's the, the biggest fool's errand to just worry about that because in because hindsight, a... everything is 2020, but yeah. on any given day, yeah. We were thinking, we were what... thinking, oh, uh, Stock to flow, uh, plan B, he's, he's still right. He's still right about his, his, you know, his lower bound model or whatever he called it. And he had hit like every number until November. And that's when we hit 69 K and then like, Oh, well then he's got Bitcoin going past hundred K in December. And it did the exact opposite. So like, it's hard to just be to just think, oh, I should have sold at 69k. Well, yeah, if we had if we had a DeLorean and a time machine and the and the almanac, sports almanac, we would all be going back in time and doing that. But all you can do is focus on like this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stack, I'm gonna hold my Bitcoin, I'm gonna hold my keys, and I'm not gonna get exposed to these to these companies like a Luna like uh like this right here with um with solana solana or solano i I can't even i don't even know how it's pronounced oh we haven't even touched on that yet yeah that's crazy this is this is the best one solana so this is from dylan claire yeah. and it's not just from dylan claire there's a lot of people and, and, just and solana is like a top it's like a top 10 cryptocurrency right or it was in the top 10 or what is it some it's somewhere up there it's uh we'll take a look later on uh i'll take a look so he says absolute comedy solon protocol a supposed decentralized lending protocol built on top of solana has voted to take over a whales account with emergency powers to eliminate the chance of force liquidation decentralized in name only 
So Solana was getting, Solon was getting uh, in risk of getting liquidated with too much, with a Solana position. So large, mar large margin position that is putting Solon protocol and all its users at risk. Here are details about the user at the time of the, of the writing. So it was a whale, they had 5.7 million Solana deposited, uh, 108 million USD and USDT, USDT borrowed. So just stable dollars, stable coin dollars. Um, uh, the loan to value is 25%, 95% of Solana deposits, main value, 88%, whatever. This is just a liquid liquidation price, $22. And so what people were scared about was, well, if this whale sale sells, we all lose, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, imagine Michael Saylor says, I'm going to sell all my Bitcoin. Yeah. And then, the, price and then, and and then the Bitcoin protocol says, wait a second, that's very bad for Bitcoin. You know what, Michael Saylor, we're going to freeze your account so you can't sell your Bitcoin anymore. <laughs> like, what the <laughs> hell? You know, it's like, that's, kind exactly. of a sh that's like a shitty shit. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. And so they granted Such emergency powers to Solon Labs to tempor temporarily take over the whale's account so the liquidation can be executed over the counter, OTC, and avoid pushing Solana to its limits. This would be done via a smart contract upgrade. But yeah, those are some great things, those smart contracts. The emergency powers will be revoked, will be revoked. Once the whale's account reaches the state <laughs> yeah. level. Reminds me of Justin Trudeau, you know, like, yeah, we need some emergency powers to, uh, you know. Yeah. We just so need this exception right now. You know, next time, what's going to be the exception next time? Exactly. Whenever you lose or when you're winning or you think you're winning, they just change the rules on you and bye-bye. <laughs> you never stood a chance. It's not, and, and all these things, they say that they're decentralized because they have a blockchain. Having a blockchain obviously does not make you decentralized having a blockchain that have hundreds of thousands of nodes that people run on top of that blockchain that they can vote where your money can't be frozen it's uncensorable censorship resistant um, it's unconfiscatable money that you decide on and that you hold your keys to there's only one and its name is bitcoin bitcoin is king and the other ones are cheap imitations. That's what all the altcoins are. So don't fall for it. Don't fall for the tricks. Don't fall for the cheap imitations. Buy the real thing. And you don't worry about it. Have peace. Be at peace with your stack. Obviously, you always want more. Do everything you can to get more. But be at peace. Be that Bitcoin Zen with where your stack is now and where it's going. And uh, don't do. Don't Just look do at the look at the numbers. Look at the market. I mean, the market has decided. You know, not only like the hashing power is the biggest, the market cap is the biggest. It's gonna trend towards like this network effects. So Bitcoin has already won. <laughs> period. Yes. And people are slowly starting to understand that. Yeah, of course, everybody wants to make a copy and just create money out of nothing, especially if you can print some for yourself first. And that's what all these new NFTs projects, and yes, your other shitcoin project to you know whoever is the founder thought, hey, I can I can make some internet money too, and if I uh, probably make a book off of it as well. Why would that project succeed in any way? It's uh, I'm so tired of it, Sean. It's like been it's, it's, what it's, five years, or okay, maybe not five years, but like. At least a good full three years of just constantly battling shit coiners and shit coin narratives. Yeah, I, I'm I'm starting to reach a point where I just don't care anymore. You know, it's just gonna be like, okay, whatever. If people don't see it yet, just let them get burnt. And it's uh, not it's not hard yeah. to see. It's not hard to see. But you but what's hard is that you have this human nature we or fiat conditioning that we have that where we where we're just running we just we just can't stop and and calm our emotions and you don't need to do any drugs you don't need to go trade something crazy you don't need to go do anything just work stack bitcoin 
and and it's hard for people to be at peace with that like you you just chill relax be at peace with where your stack is stack hard but be at peace with where you're stacking and if and if you're not at peace with where you're stacking playing these fiat games is not going to help you out it's not the answer and um, and i think a lot of people just have to get burned to figure that out and maybe they will get burned there's nothing that we can do besides educate and that's what we're doing is trying to educate everyone on the advantages of bitcoin the disadvantages of all the altcoins they're all imitations they're all here to steal your bitcoin so that's all we can do is educate and talk more and that's it that is it for bitcoiners guide episode 18 is it over already already over these ones happen fast as a reminder uh Kreezus joins the meme factory podcast this thursday at 7 30 p.m live that's eastern time on our youtube what's channel his name again? what what's his name again Kreezus Krozis. honestly i don't know how to pronounce his name i've never heard i don't know how to pronounce it i think it's, it's funny Kreezus. I, I always say cruises cruises I'm not sure. I don't know. We will find out. We will find this. If you want to know how to pronounce his name, we'll find out. Um, although his articles, he's, he's a smart dude. This is one smart dude, one smart Bitcoiner. Yeah. Um, and again, he makes great, makes great animations, explains it in a yes. way that people can really understand it. I love his animations also about how the halving works. You know? Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. Bitcoin having, yeah. Bitcoin having party coming 2024. Don't miss that. Um, as re and remember one more thing what you see here what you hear here when you leave here don't just let it stay here please share like and subscribe we love doing bitcoiners guide we want to keep doing it um let it it's free be. just help us out for free just give it a like it's free you know yes. like we're really happy with it leave a little comment come on guys just, yes just a we little like a little comment and you know how it works the algo man you yes. need some more viewers so we don't get paid for this. We are doing this for free. And because we really like Bitcoin, we think it should. We want to give as many people an opportunity to learn about Bitcoin, to understand Bitcoin, but to understand it from a Bitcoiner's point of view, not from the fiat mind. And so that's why we're doing this. Um, so as for Bitcoiner's Guide, episode 18, we're going to keep chugging along from Plan Marcus and Big Sean. We're over now. Peace.